We're good. All right. Well, I'm going to cover a lot of material today. Uh, we're going to focus on, on crop insurance and then also talk briefly about where we see corn, soybean, cotton prices going as we move um, into, uh, in, into this uh, planting season and as we approach the production season. So first thing I kind of want to go through, me and Andrew were discussing some of this uh, right before we started the meeting, but crop insurance prices have been set for our key row crops. Uh, corn was set at 458, cotton at 83 cents, soybeans at 1187. There's a couple of points I want to make right, right now with this. March uh, closing or March 15th is the sales closing date. So you'll want to make sure you finalize your, your crop insurance elections. You might be in for a little bit of sticker shock on the premium expenses this year. Uh, obviously, with the higher uh, projected spring prices relative to last year, we will end up seeing increased premiums. The other one that is, is kind of flying, flying under the, the radar is the price volatility. And I've, I've shown the factors there and the increases in that. And that doesn't necessarily directly affect what your coverage is gonna be, but it does definitely affect what your premium is gonna be. And prices have been more volatile in February this year than they were last year. And so both of those factors are gonna push uh, crop insurance premiums higher than they were last year. And in, in some cases, substantially higher for the same coverage level. One good set of news about this, if you do buy the same coverage level, and I'm not suggesting you should reduce coverage level, I think since the, the potential crop is worth more, I think the protection um, at the same level or maybe even a higher level, depending on where you were, is warranted. But this does create a very different in-season risk profile for our, our row crop producers. And one of the things that we have seen, we've seen some additions of additional products so and options in terms of, of crop insurance. So Working with a, a crop insurance agent is essential. There's a lot of information to digest, a lot of scenarios that you can run. We have some great crop insurance agents across the state. So, you know, use that resource to make sure you're getting the most out of your, your crop insurance product, both from a coverage standpoint and trying to end up uh, maintaining a reasonable premium level. So when we look at crop insurance, this is just kind of a, a basic example. I'll kind of, kind of show what, what, how this leads to the marketing component. I use soybeans in here. Revenue guarantee, very basic, 1187 a bushel is the price. If you have a 45 bushel APH times 75%, what you get is a $400 per acre uh, revenue guarantee. If you have a cost of production of 450, you can compare those two and see what you've got in terms of unprotected uh, revenue. And so when we look at this, there's a couple of very basic questions that you should be asking yourself and your crop insurance agent. Can you increase your APH? And so when we look at this, you know, that's one of the ones where it's the easiest way to get a higher revenue guarantee is to increase your, your APH. Should you increase your buy-up level? If you were buying at 70%, maybe it makes sense to go to 75 or 80%. You really have to run those numbers and see what the corresponding premium cost increase is. Can you modify the unit structure? Again, this is a very operation specific uh, component when we look at the unit structure. Some, it'll be very beneficial to look at the enterprise units. Obviously, you're going to get specific field level coverage if you're looking at basic or, or optional. And then what are the other availables? There's some area products that are out there, trend adjustments, yield exclusions. You really have to work through those to make sure you're getting the best for your crop insurance. And how this kind of works, um, it's, not a, it's not a substitute for marketing your crops. What it is, is a complement to an in-season uh, risk management plan. And so I kind of just graphically kind of tried to show that where you have a cost of production. In this example, I've got it at 450. It's going to vary tremendously between producers across the state. But what it shows is your crop insurance under these assumptions, 75% uh, buy up 45 bushel per acre APH and, and the 1187 price. You know, you would have, um, you know, about $400 that would be secured. Now you would have under these different prices, you know, potentially increased revenue that doesn't have revenue protection. That's where, you know, you can kind of look at, okay, well, do I want to increase my marketing or so your, your sales, whether it's through futures options or, or cash forward contracts to protect some of this unprotected revenue. Uh, so when we look at this, you know, the minimum uh, crop insurance protection is always set in the spring but we do end up getting the potential to increase that with the October price uh, determination, unless you elect not to participate in the, or to end up having the harvest price exclusion. I wouldn't advise uh, doing that under these circumstances because currently right now we tend to end up seeing if that 
price goes up in the fall. So if we did end up seeing a major production disruption, it usually goes up substantially. And so that adds another layer of protection for crop insurance. So, you know, the biggest thing before I move into the outlook is just make sure that you get with your crop insurance agent, finalize your, your crop insurance products because they are an incredibly powerful risk management tool and they're cost effective relative to the premium. Yes, we are gonna see higher premiums, but boy, it does provide a, a pretty good safety net in terms of, of revenue for, a, for, a, for a, a row crop producer. Now to kind of move towards outlook, this is a, a quote from John Robinson from Texas A&M. He's their cotton economist out there. And I really liked it because it kind of hits the nail on the head under the current environment. It says, doing nothing all season is a strategy. It avoids upfront option premiums and possible future margin calls. But the cost of this strategy is bearing the risk of lower prices all season long. Uh, in that sense, doing nothing is the ultimate form of speculation. So I, I think that rings pretty true right now. Obviously, where prices are right now, um, things are looking very good, but we really need to capitalize on that, those opportunities. Could prices go high, abs ha higher? Absolutely. But what we really want to do is start pricing a little bit of that production if we haven't to kind of remove some of that downside risk on, on the table. So when we look at factors that are, that are affecting supply, I've kind of broken it down into two categories. One that's positive for prices, one that's more negative or uncertain for prices. So on the positive supply side, you know, we have tight US and global ending stocks, low stocks to use ratios. Um, we do have high prices for many crops. Uh, it makes acreage incredibly competitive for planting. If you look across you know, cotton, soybeans, corn, sorghum, all of those are very price competitive right now. Wheat, when you look at the spring crops up in the Dakotas, it makes it so that it's a very competitive planted acreage. So we only have a, a certain number of acres. Yes, we'll pull in maybe some periphery acres that weren't in production. We'll have to wait and see what happens with prevented planting. But that's something that, you know, it's going to be very competitive for acres because there is an incentive to plant. We have seen some concerns in South America, particularly for corn, um, down in Brazil with the second crop planting, the harvest of soybeans is delayed. And so again, the longer that harvest is delayed, it's going to end up um, potentially uh, affecting when corn is pollinating during their dry season. So that's something that's important on the corn side of things. We did see reduced production in, in Argentina for soybeans. There are a limited number of export competitors. When you look at beans, Argentina, Brazil, and the U.S. are the dominant ones. There's always challenges with logistics um, and export market timing down in, in Brazil. One of the things that is important to note is there is a, a substantial amount of production coming from Brazil. It's just a question of when it's gonna end up reaching, reaching the market. One of the questions that we were, we were discussing uh, a few days ago was, you know, in 2021, can we grow our way out of this rally? You know, the cure to, to high prices is high prices, right? It's gonna increase production. And the answer to that is, it depends on the weather, right? Um, we'll have to see what the 2021 year brings, but if we get the, the 92 million acres of corn and 90 million acres of, of soybeans, it will definitely dampen prices. Um, I'm a little bit uh, less optimistic, or I, I think there's a lower chance that we would end up growing our way out of the current soybean rally, corn rally. And again, it's not to say we couldn't do both, but when we look at some of the, yeah, yeah. Okay. supply and demand numbers, um, there's a little bit more of a bullish scenario that you can paint on the soybean side in terms of maintaining prices, maybe not at current levels, but definitely elevated compared to recent years. So uh, for corn, if we get a record yield, you can see us kind of outproducing uh, the current market rally and having prices pull back a little bit. Again, I don't see it falling back to where we were, but I do think that there's a, a greater risk there. Rising input costs is, is really important. And I put in this last bullet point near record ma long managed money. And that's more just a, as an indication of why we are expecting to continue to see volatility in the markets of those positions end up adjusting over time. When we look at factors affecting demand. So that was the supply side. When we look at the demand side, Andrew's gonna talk uh, about the, the livestock sector, but the USDA is projecting record beef, pork and broiler production for 2021. We have seen a bit of a bounce back in ethanol. I think there's a real upside there if we do get into export markets, particularly into China. We don't know what carbon policy is gonna bring, but that could be a positive for, for ethanol for sure um, as, a, as a carbon mitigation tool. But again, we'll have to see what the policy side of that is. 
We've had strong domestic crush for soybeans. The US dollar index has been near five-year lows in recent times. And one thing that really surprised me uh, a couple of weeks ago is when USDA did their initial ag outlook form, you know, they were, everybody always says that, you know, we're very bullish on Chinese ag exports in, in the last few months, but they were very bullish. They were more so, usually USDA is a little bit more cautious in their, their projections, but what they were looking at in terms of ag exports was very robust for 2021. So that's definitely a positive. And we do see increased global protein demand and meat consumption. In terms of negative and uncertain for crop prices, you know, COVID-19, I don't know to, to really predict on that. That's something that, that adds a, a level of uncertainty. Same with African swine fever. Obviously, it's well documented, China rebuilding that hog herd. But at the same time, we don't know. These, these, these sets of circumstances are difficult to, to pr predict. Um, high prices can limit demand and result in substitution. That one's a little bit more tricky because we are in, in, in a environment where we do have tight stocks for multiple commodities uh, on the global st stage. The one exception there is wheat. Wheat is one where we don't maybe have the uh, tight stock circumstances. In fact, the USDA is still projecting record stocks of wheat. Uh, the US is a little bit different. Our stocks are declining. That's why we've been able to see prices maintained in addition to competition for, for corn and bean acres. China is still unpredictable. There's, there's not a lot of information that you can really um, put a lot of uh, stock in coming out of there. It's very difficult to get a get an understanding of how they're moving their their both their domestic policy and then what they're doing on the trade front. And then we do have U.S. and 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 global trade uncertainty as well. I'm going to go th through these real quick. The only things that I want to point out in terms of global supply and demand is that we're exceed consumption is exceeding demand and stocks for corn have fallen for four years in a row. When we look at soybeans, same picture, we've ended up seeing uh, consumption exceeding uh, production, we've seen stocks drop two years in a row. And when we see cotton, we've seen, again, consumption is expected to end up uh, in, surpassing uh, consu uh, uh, production for, for 2021. The one thing that's a little different in, in cotton, and one of the reasons why we've seen such a, a dramatic uh, bounce back in cotton prices is a lot of the COVID-19 disruptions um, and the long-term demand drag has not been as severe as anticipated. And that's really propelled um, you know, cotton upwards. For those that follow cotton markets, it's one of the ones that it continues to end up increasing over the last few, few, uh, few months. So when we look at this, you know, demand is so important. Um, yes, you know, production and stocks, but without that demand, you know, you really don't have that pull uh, in terms of the balance. So when we look at this, the, the main reason why we've seen this dramatic increase in prices has been exports, particularly exports to China. And so we'll show corn in 2021 relative to the previous three years. And there's really no comparison. We've had very strong sales. I anticipate these sales to continue, um, maybe not at the same pace, but we still have you know, some reserves of corn that continue to end up moving out to China. With soybeans, again, you see that very robust export sales um, position to, to China. The one challenge that we are going to run to on, on the soybean side is we just don't have enough stocks to continue the same pace. So this is really going to flatline. We're only not even quite halfway through the marketing year, but we're really going to basically run out of soybeans to export uh, in the U.S. And it'll, the demand, Chinese demand will shift down to, to South America. Cotton, very same thing when we look at past years. Now we do have to put the caveat on here that we were in the middle of the trade war um, with China for, for these years. So again, you do have to take that with a grain of salt, but we are seeing a, a very, very strong export pace to, to China. When we look at production, this does take both the current marketing year and the projected 2021 crop. So this, this very far uh, bar, the 21-22 marketing year is the current USDA projection from the Ag Outlook form. And what you will see is, is, a, is a very close parallel to what's happened in this past year where we've seen the higher prices. So again, this bodes well for you know, maintaining, maybe not at, at these high levels that are right now, but definitely elevated prices to where we've been. When we look at stocks of corn estimated at 1.55 billion bushels, pretty much same as, as where we're at right now. So again, that does bode very well for 2021 prices. When we look at soybeans, I mentioned we've been essentially um, or functionally out of soybeans in terms of adding export sales at 120 million bushels. Even with 90 million acres of, of soybeans 
uh, projected to be planted. It does barely move that needle in terms of what that stocks uh, numbers projected for the 21-22 market year. So again, these are very optimistic looking numbers. They can change dramatically, obviously, but there is some optimism in where we are heading from the row crop side of things in terms of price. Same thing with cotton, where we are seeing, you know, further reductions in, in ending stocks, which is good uh, for prices. It's, it's not, they said it was cattle, but it's all, it's a row crop stuff. So when we look at uh, prevented planting, um, when we look at projected planting, you know, nationally for the USDA, uh, we have 90 million acres projected for soybeans, 92 million acres for, for corn, and then 12 million acres for, for cotton. When we look at Tennessee, some initial estimates that we potentially have is 1.7 million acres for soybeans, corn at 965,000 acres, and then cotton at 325,000. And so again, I mentioned, you know, planting weather and preventive planting is really going to influence the direction of these, these crop allocations, both within the state and across the, the country. And there is still an incentive to plant a lot of uh, commodities. Uh, when we look at Tennessee, we have our three primary spring planted crops, and then we can end up, um, you know, looking at other regions where there's, there's other crop allocations that are highly competitive as well. I just want to mention input prices real quick. Um, this is the, the, the weekly fertilizer prices. Uh, you can see that in, in the new year here, we've went almost vertical in terms of prices. So if you did purchase your price in the fall, you're under a very different um, input cost structure than we are currently uh, right now. And so again, I use for fertilizer prices to highlight this. It's not the only cost that's increased. If you look at diesel fuel prices, there's several prices that we've seen dramatic increase. So that's really gonna affect where we are in terms of cost of production. I wanna kind of close just with doing some price um, comparisons before I turn it over to Andrew to do the, the livestock. Uh, outlook. When we look at where we're at in 2021, what I've put on here is where the December corn futures contract has done from January 1st to expiration. Obviously, we've only got two months uh, of data in 2021, but as of right now, we've averaged 453 and we've had a, a range of 430 to 470. I, I highlighted 2013, 2014, because there is some parallels there in terms of, of what prices have 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 or what some people are saying we're under the, a similar kind of price environment. And so when we look at that, that does offer a point of comparison. The bottom line here gives us the, the marketing or average price. And that's the USDA price projection uh, that they end up doing kind of as an average farm level price. And so you can see how it compares to past production years. The other important thing here is I put a min and max in here. And this gives you the range of prices that were offered on the December contract from January 1 to the ex expiration. And the one thing that you will note is if you do have um, you know, a, a wider variation in, in what the prices trade, trading are back in 2013 and 14 than we have under current circumstances. So that can be uh, factored into our price expectations. On a basis, we've seen very strong, this is for elevators and barge points. Um, when we look along the Mississippi River, we've seen very strong basis numbers. We expect that to continue due to the strong demand factors that are, are currently present. Similar for soybeans, where right now we've averaged 11.74 on the November contract. USDA is projecting a marking year average price of 11.25. And obviously we've seen, you know, some very dramatic swings in the past when we look at the max versus the min price that's been offered. So again, we need to factor that into our price expectations moving through this year. Still for soybeans, we've seen very strong basis activity as well relative to the, the five-year average um, in the last three months. Cotton prices, they're also very, very strong with an average of 80.7. We're actually been bumping up close to 90 in, in recent trading sessions. So that's something that's uh, beneficial if you are looking at getting into, into cotton. So in terms of marketing strategies, this is probably one of the, the number one uh, questions I get is what can I use in order to protect against the downside, but still allow for price increases on the on the upside. And so, you know, there's there's many, many different different strategies, but two that I, I do encourage people to at least investigate 
you know, you can buy puts. The, the, the key when you're buying puts is looking at, okay, well, what's the strike price? And then do I want to do a premium offset? And so again, that's something that you can either investigate or speak with your, your broker or your marketer with. The other one is you can forward contract or short hedge and then buy calls to take advantage of, of rallies in the futures market. So again, doing a little investigation or if you would like to discuss further, you can always email me or call me and we can kind of walk through the process of, of using these, these tools. In terms of closing comments, you know, it, it's really important to understand the current market environment. There's, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty at this time of year because we don't have good estimates on, on acreage. Um, there are some very positives on the demand side, but you know, there's always the, you always run the risk of having a black swan event. So you do wanna make sure that you, you, uh, you know, do take some of that downside risk off the table. Evaluate your storage capacity relative to anticipated produ production. You know, I think this holds pretty much across the US, but it's really amplified in Tennessee. Storage is, is, is I, I think, the most important marketing tool that, that row crop producers in our state have available to them. Uh, it allows you to extend that marketing window and really capture some beneficial basis movements as we move out of the harvest season. When we look at uh, the amount priced at different times during the year, this is incredibly operation specific. What? Everybody has their comfort levels. You want to get a pizza? Encourage people to well, end correct. up having some of their 2021 production price. Um, you want a breakfast? So that they do take some of that risk off the off the table. Where'd you go get a pizza at? Right there, over. And so you don't want to. That, um, you know, you again, it's very operational specific. Can I ask that? Oh, 25 to 50 percent. Must be hungry this morning. You hungry? So, you know, you want to have some of your production ended up priced. Uh, one thing I will caution is, that, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of get overextended when we see rallies this way. Um, but if you're getting up close to that 75 plus percent price, you can easily price your way out of a rally. And what I mean by that is if we got a drought in the Midwest, we could see some fantastic um, opportunities to price at even higher levels. And so again, you know, I, it is important to take some of the downside off the table, um, but you do want to make sure that you're not cash forward contracting or securing a, a price on, on too much of your acreage. And so again, that's something that you need to end up weighing where you're at. The last thing that I will end up saying is it's not too early to look at 2022. You know, when you look at December futures contracts at 432 and, and soybeans at 1098, um, I'm not saying that you have to pull the trigger, but it's definitely something you want to keep in the back of your head. So I'll close with these some very wide price range estimates for Tennessee cash prices, both for old and new crop. These will be posted if you want to take a closer look at them. Um, we have seen old crop prices, excluding cotton, move sideways for about a month and a half now. So, you know, factor that in as to, to what your expectations are moving into the, into the summer. It's very early in the 2020 production. You'll see that in the, the wide range of prices, you know, without knowing what we're going to plant, what our production season is going to look like. You know, you can make a pretty good argument um, for prices to go higher. You know, you can also paint a scenario where we do end up seeing a pullback in, in prices if we have a, a really strong production year. The big thing that I, I caution people is expect volatility in both old crop and new crop and try to protect yourself um, using the risk management tools that are available. And it'll really be planted acres that'll be our next major market mover. We've seen some projections come out. We'll see the March prospective planting report at, at March 31st. And so we'll end up, uh, you know, having that as, as some additional information to digest. And so again, we are in a, in a bull market, but uh, unfortunately, all bulls end up getting slaughtered at some point in time. I'm not saying that it'll necessarily happen in this, this year, but you do want to end up protecting yourself um, moving forward. So again, utilize those risk management tools that are available to try to end up taking some of that risk off the table.